Happy Monday, everybody. My name is Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist. Thanks for tuning in to another Planetarium live stream, and I uh, hope you all had a wonderful weekend, uh, and glad to see you back here again for another What's Up live stream for the week. We're going to take a little tour of the night sky, see what we can spot in our evenings this week, uh, and uh, we are going to also cover a little bit of space news that popped up. If you're joining us uh, for the first time, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Just a reminder that uh, you can check out all of our previous live streams if you missed any on all of our Facebook pages. They are recorded there for you to watch. Uh, and right now our schedule is Mondays and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Mondays we'll be streaming our What's Up stream for the week, our live star tour, and Wednesdays are, is our deep dive live stream where we cover a variety of uh, space-related topics. Um, we've, we've talked about stellar evolution, we've set up a telescope live on air, um, we've learned about the uh, golden record, the messages attached to the Voyager space probes, a lot of interesting topics. Again, you can re-watch all of those streams on uh, the Facebook pages. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium Facebook page if you haven't yet. Um, you can follow all sorts of other space news there as it pops up as well. Uh, and uh, one last shout out before we started. I wanted to thank uh, all of our uh, supporters, uh, everybody who supported Union Station and uh, the Science Center's programs over the past uh, couple months. Um, we've been working hard to continue bringing you science in the form of these live streams or the Instructables posted on the Science City pages. And all of your support has been uh, a huge a huge help in uh, keeping us going as well as uh, keep uh, giving all of us motivation to keep going for sure um, so thank you for supporting thank you for uh, sharing these uh, streams thank you for commenting um, and uh, to those of you who have supported in other ways uh, like donating thank you to you as well especially uh, to our 10,000 act active Union Station members we couldn't do this without you uh, just another reminder that Union Station has announced its initial plans to start a slow reopening uh, those plans are relatively lim limited, but uh, they do. Uh, we have released a couple uh, outlines for different phases of reopening that will be starting in the middle of June. I'm not going to go into detail here, but if you go to the Union Station Facebook page or UnionStation.org, all of that information is there. So be sure to check that out. We can't wait to see you uh, in person back at the station. So we are going to go ahead and jump in, and like I've been doing for our Monday streams, I'm going to talk a little bit about some space news that's coming up, uh, or uh, that happened over the past week. So a uh, pretty fun uh, little announcement uh, that uh, popped up a few days ago on May 12th. Uh, scientists from uh, New Zealand's University of Canterbury announced they had discovered uh, a super-Earth, uh, an exoplanet, uh, similar to Earth in a different solar system. Now we have discovered thousands of exoplanets, um, but very few of these exoplanets are uh, um, in the what we call the Goldilocks zone, which is the perfect distance from their parent star to be potentially habitable. And also as many of these planets are not the right size uh, to uh, be a solid planet like Earth. Uh, many of them are larger gas giants. Uh, but this planet that um, was discovered um, is a super Earth. So this uh, Earth uh, is um, uh, about the same size as Earth, uh, and it uh, has about the same or orbital distance relative to its star. Its year lasts about 617 days, and it's located closer to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This is an uh, artist rendition. Obviously, we can't get an actual photograph of this potential Earth, um, but a pretty uh, exciting announcement nonetheless. Um, uh, I wanted to bring this up though because the technique that they use to discover this exoplanet is uh, gravitational microlensing, which we've actually discussed in a previous live stream. I believe it was the live stream on Messier objects uh, because uh, astronomers use um, uh, uh, star clusters to uh, do this technique called gravitational microlensing, which basically detects exoplanets by recording changes in brightness as stars are eclipsed by uh, planets and the gravitational uh, the, the gravity of these uh, planets will affect the brightness of stars. Um, so pretty cool technique uh, that we have already brought up during one of these streams. But that's a fun announcement. Let's go back over here. Um, another kind of interesting uh, announcement that was made uh, is a few days ago, uh, NASA uh, t did a, a test aboard one of their spacecraft, the Cygnus spacecraft, which is like a cargo spacecraft that we often use to send supplies to the International Space Station. But as the Cygnus uh, capsule departed uh, about a week ago, they did a fire test. So they actually intentionally started a fire in this spacecraft 
uh, to measure uh, what would happen if uh, a, a, a fire was sort of let loose aboard a spacecraft. Um, now, there weren't any people in the spacecraft. Uh, in fact, this um, the spacecraft was uh, going to be uh, was going to disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere anyway. So they just used that opportunity to uh, test out these emergency situations uh, in a non uh, a dangerous setting, basically. Uh, and I couldn't get information about the results of this test. Um, just uh, plans to do it, so I assume they did it, and I assume it worked out okay. Um, another interesting uh, piece of news, uh, sort of kind of political news, I guess, but related to space travel. And NASA has created something called the Artemis Accords, um, which uh, are named after the Artemis program, which is NASA's plan to bring uh, people back to the moon in the near future. Uh, and these accords uh, basically are outlining a sort of an international uh, agreement um, related to the future of space travel. Um, and the idea is that other nations would sign these accords and they would just be a, a, good, a good faith agreement between countries um, to uh, just so, sort of follow general practices when it comes to space exploration. Uh, and you can see uh, these are the slides that NASA provided um, about these specific accords. So uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a nice way that um, NASA is sort of leading uh, the charge to uh, continue international cooperation, which is very important uh, to the continuation of human space flight. So you can read more about the Artemis Accords uh, if you'd like, but I'm going to move on to the last little bit of news I wanted to bring up, and this is about the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, uh, many people say, um, is sort of the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this is a uh, space telescope that we have been, uh, well, that scientists have been building and working on for uh, quite a while. They have been constructing this for uh, many years, and uh, and the uh, launch of this spacecraft has also been postponed for many years. Uh, right now, the scheduled launch date is March of 2021, next year. Uh, but uh, this space telescope did reach an important milestone. It was folded up and stowed in its configuration for the first time, how it will be uh, installed in the rocket that it will actually take it to space. So this is the first time that all the components have been folded up after they have been rigorously tested uh, and it is now in the configuration uh, as it will be when it does finally launch in about 10 months. So stay tuned for that. We will of course track that story as we get closer to that launch. Hopefully it will not be postponed again, but who knows. <laughs> So uh, that does it for news. Uh, one last little bit of news I wanted to bring up is that as of now, uh, the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon launch is still scheduled for next Wednesday, May 27th. Uh, and for those of you who haven't heard or missed out, uh, this is a momentous and very important launch. Uh, this will be the first time that uh, American astronauts have launched aboard an American uh, spacecraft on American soil uh, since 2011 when the space shuttle program was decommissioned. Um, so uh, the, these astronauts are uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, who are both uh, NASA pilots, and they will be uh, flying aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, this capsule has been uh, tested without people before, uh, and um, it, uh, it's been tested on the ground with people, but this will be the first uh, human launch, uh, and this capsule will be launching above a Falcon 9 rocket, um, which is pretty cool. Those are the rockets that they intentionally bring back down and land and reuse. This particular Falcon 9 will be a brand new one, I'm told. Um, but the idea is that it would be a lot cheaper to uh, refuel a rocket rather than rebuild it. Um, but anyway, uh, that's still scheduled for next Wednesday. We will be continuing coverage of that over the next week. And of course, our next Wednesday live stream will be all about that uh, Crew Dragon launch, how it went, and uh, talking about SpaceX in general. So, so stay tuned for that. Uh, speaking of Wednesday live streams, this Wednesday we will be talking about uh, the uh, science and astronomy uh, around fiction. So there are many fantastical universes in fiction, and there are many different uh, uh, universes and stories in fiction that uh, have different takes on astronomy, whether it's um, tweaking the uh, tweaking aspects of physics in a little way or basing their universe on actual physics. So we'll talk a little bit about a couple of these universes uh, like Terry Pratchett's Discworld or Westeros from Game of Thrones uh, and a couple others. So be sure to stay tuned and tune in this Wednesday um, for Fantastical Universes of Fiction, our Wednesday live stream. And then next Wednesday will be SpaceX, of course, with our Star Tour on Monday again. Let's go and jump into today's Star Tour. We're going to head back on over to um, 
Stellarium. This is a free piece of software we've shared before and we can share again for you all if you want to download this and use this at home. This is basically a virtual planetarium. I've tweaked it a little bit uh, to, uh, to show us um, the Kansas City skyline, of course. We were standing on the steps of the Liberty Memorial. And I'm seeing also we're getting uh, a couple uh, questions here. Um, I should have, actually I'm gonna pause for a moment before we jump into our tour and take a look at these questions. Um, so we've got a question from Eric about uh, countries that have viable space programs. Uh, how many countries have a viable space programs? Uh, and uh, there are quite a few, um, just to name a couple of them. Um, and I'm kind of going back over to uh, notes about our uh, probes and rovers that we talked about on a previous live stream. I dived a little bit more in depth to different countries' space programs, but um, the sort of big players right now that have active missions um, are the United States, uh, Russia, the European Union, European Union uh, as a collective, and then Japan, China, India, and Israel all have active space agencies with many other countries uh, developing space agencies as well. But those are the ones that have active programs. Um, uh, Zeke is talking about how uh, they were learning about Jupiter's gravitational pull contributing to uh, meteor showers and potentially a meteor that uh, made the dinosaurs extinct. Um, it, and I'd encourage you to all watch my uh, live stream about the solar system. We did a solar system tour where I talked a little bit more in depth about Jupiter and its gravitational effect on our solar system. Uh, and as, as Zeke is suggesting here, um, uh, Jupiter has had a profound impact on the development of our solar system and uh, Earth, and uh, it could have potentially uh, led to um, uh, you know, certain space rocks coming to Earth, maybe around the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. But um, more importantly, Jupiter has helped uh, humanity uh, by protecting the Earth. Um, it is so massive that it has captured the orbits of many large objects that it could have been even more dangerous to the development of life on Earth. Um, so good thing to bring up there, Zeke. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump back over to Stellarium and let's uh, dive into our star tour. So uh, in our daytime sky, the sun will be over in the west at this time of night. This is our current skies, uh, as you can see, at 6 o'clock, 6.12. And uh, that sun is getting lower, although as the days get longer, the sun will be setting later in the evening. Uh, for our evening tour for today, we are going to be fast forwarding time and we are, we'll be spending our star tour about an hour after sunset tonight, which will be pretty late tonight probably around 9.30 or even 10 o'clock. I usually recommend waiting till about an hour after sunset to go stargazing. Um, so fast forwarding here. So here's uh, our skies at about 9.30. Now there are, uh, th this is a simulation of our night sky. So the night sky you're seeing right here is definitely not what you would see standing in this exact spot in Kansas City. When you're near a big city like KC, uh, there's a lot of light pollution. Uh, lights from man-made light sources like buildings and streetlights and car headlights that shine up into the sky and bounce off our atmosphere. And when you're near the city, they make the sky glow, so it's a bit harder to see the stars. Um, so to see a night sky like this, you're actually going to have to travel about an hour away from town. Um, and if you travel about an hour west, uh, then you'll find a night sky more similar to this. On a clear night, the human eye can see around 2,000 stars maximum with just the naked eye alone. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and begin talking about our northern sky. There are a couple familiar patterns in the north that I like to begin with, and if you tuned into one of my previous star tours, you already know about these, but I always like starting with them because it's nice to start from a familiar standpoint. Um, and these two shapes appear to us as big spoons in the sky. These are the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Now, the Big and Little Dipper are two very famous patterns. However, they are not official constellations. The Big and Little Dipper are not official star patterns. They belong to a different category. They're what we call asterisms. An asterism is an unofficial star pattern. So any group or pattern of stars that is not an official constellation. There are 88 official constellations. These were picked back in 1930 by an organization called the International Astronomical Union. Um, but uh, there are many more than just 88 patterns that people can see in the stars. You can connect those dots in a lot of different ways. So any non-official pattern is called an asterism. Now there are two official constellations that use the same stars as our dippers. They are called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, and I'll teach you how to find these. Ursa Major means the Big Bear, and Ursa Minor means the Little Bear. The Big Bear contains the stars of the Big Dipper, and it's upside down in our late spring and early summer skies. The tail of the bear is the handle of the spoon here. 
The body of the bear contains the spoon plus these two stars. The head of the bear goes over to this star, and its legs extend up into the sky. Again, it's upside down right now. There's the tail again, there's the body, the head, and the legs. Ursa Minor, the little bear, its stars are a bit dimmer, but you can see and imagine a similar pattern there. Now there's a very famous star at the end of the little bear's tail here. If you draw an imaginary line through the two stars at the end of the Big Dipper's spoon, it points right at this star, and this star is named Polaris. Polaris is also nicknamed the North Star. Now the North Star is a very famous and important star in our night sky, but not for the reason you might think. Uh, it is a common misconception that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, but that's not actually true. In fact, the North Star is the 45th brightest star, so it's not even anywhere close. In reality, the North Star is special not because of its brightness, it's special because it does something kind of strange throughout the night. Now remember, this is the early evening sky, but if you were to stay up later, you would notice that most of the stars in the sky don't stay in the same place all night. If I fast forward time again, we can see this motion, and as you can see, the stars move throughout the evening. In the west, you can see that stars are setting, and in the east, you can see that they are rising. There's another famous star you might know of that rises in the east and sets in the west, our sun, of course. But the sun and the stars aren't actually spinning around us, it's the Earth that's spinning. The Earth is rotating around its axis once every 24 hours, and since all of us happen to be on Earth right now, from our perspective, it looks like the stuff in the sky is moving. And here we are in our uh, daytime sky tomorrow, but we don't want to see that view of the sky, so we're going to rewind Ooh, a little bit too far. Too far again. <laughs> All right. So again, we're going to spend our star tour at around 9.30. As I mentioned, you can find the North Star by using those two stars at the end of the spoon of the Big Dipper, drawing an imaginary line down there. Now, if we go past the North Star and continue down towards the horizon, we can see two constellations that are part of a famous story in Greek mythology. The first constellation looks like a little W or a little zigzag above Union Station here. This constellation's name is Cassiopeia. Next to Cassiopeia is a little house-shaped constellation. This one's called Cepheus. Now, I've said this before, but I'm pretty sure that ancient people had much better imaginations than we do today. They saw these squiggly lines and boxes in the sky uh, as <laughs> as these complicated patterns. Not really sure where they got that from, but there you go. So in mythology, Cepheus and Cassiopeia were the king and queen of an ancient African nation. The queen Cassiopeia was very beautiful, but she was also very vain. She liked to brag about her beauty, and in this uh, image we can see her holding a mirror. Now one day Cassiopeia boasted that she was more beautiful than the daughters of Poseidon, the god of the sea. When Poseidon heard about this, he was not very happy, as you can imagine. A mere mortal claiming she was more beautiful than his immortal daughters, he could not let that stand. So as punishment, he cursed their land with years and years of flooding, washing away many of their crops and sending their kingdom into a, into a terrible famine. Cepheus and Cassiopeia tried desperately to appease the god Poseidon and ease his wrath. They eventually did what any two good parents would have done in the situation, and they decided to sacrifice their own daughter to the sea god. They tied their daughter to some rocks by the ocean, so she could be eaten by Cetus, a giant sea monster, and one of Poseidon's other children. Now, luckily for uh, their daughter, this story has a happy ending, but unfortunately, their daughter, whose name is Andromeda, is a constellation that will be rising in our fall night sky. So unfortunately, we won't be able to see the end of this story during our star tour today. I guess I'll just have to come back to the planetarium in the fall and see our fall star tour to find out how that story ends. Let's go ahead and continue on. We are going to move on to the western sky. Now, in the western horizon, before the sun finishes setting, you'll notice a very bright point of light. And this point of light is so bright, it'll stand out amongst all the stars around it. This point of light, you'll also notice, is not twinkling. Now, the reason stars twinkle is because they're very far away from Earth, and it takes a long time for a distant star's light to reach our planet. 
By the time a star's light does reach the Earth, only a tiny amount of it is it, it, uh, excuse me, only a tiny amount of it is able to pass through the Earth's dense atmosphere, and our atmosphere causes that little bit of light to become distorted, making that little speck of light appear to wobble and twinkle. But this object is much closer than distant stars, so a lot more of its light is reflected back towards Earth, and it appears as a wider disk of light, so it does not twinkle. This is a planet. You can also tell it's a planet because it won't be in the same place every night. Planets appear to wander around our night sky as they orbit the sun at their own pace. That's actually how they got their name. The word planet means wanderer in ancient Greek. And this particular wanderer you'll see in the western sky tonight is the planet Venus. Now, you might notice another bright point of light right behind Venus, and it looks to me that this point of light is not twinkling as well. And this is the planet Mercury. Now in my simulation, Mercury is very, very bright, but Mercury is usually actually a pretty hard planet to spot, and you'll need to get very, very far away from the city lights to see it. But I just wanted to point that out if you did notice. Um, there is another planet you can see setting in the west, but this one's much harder to spot. Uh, just in my simulation, it's appearing a little bit brighter than usual. But let's go ahead and talk about Venus here. Let's zoom in on our sister planet. Now Venus is a very bright point of light right now, but you might be surprised to see that Venus is actually barely visible. It's a very, it's only visible in a crescent shape right now. And now Venus is soon going to be out of sight. You won't be able to see it in our evening sky. Um, and uh, for, for the time being, we can see just a little crescent of it. Now both Venus and Mercury are unusual in that they are, are the only two planets that will appear in a crescent phase. This is because they're closer to the sun than the Earth is. Um, but it's amazing that even when Venus, even when a tiny fraction of Venus's light is illuminated, it still is very bright. So again, Venus will be setting uh, and won't be visible for a few months, uh, but it'll be visible again in the fall. Um, Venus is nicknamed the morning star and the evening star. Of course, it's not a star, but it's nicknamed that because it always appears in the early morning or early evening sky, depending on its position and its orbital, orbital path. But it will always appear near the sun uh, because it is closer to the sun than the Earth is. Let's talk about this constellation right here. This is Gemini the Twins. This is a fun one. It looks like two stick figures holding hands. These two bright stars are the stick figures' heads. Here's one body, his arms and legs. Here's the other head, his body, arms and legs. These twins were named Castor and Pollux, and they were a famous pair of Greek heroes. We're going to continue onwards. Right above the Liberty Memorial, towards the south, is Leo the Lion. You can find Leo by using an asterism that looks like a backwards question mark. This is Leo's head and his, uh, his mane. Here's Leo's body, his front paws, and tail. Leo represents the Nemean lion. This was the ferocious beast that Hercules fought and defeated during the first of his 12 labors. By the way, I see I, we've got a question, another question from Zeke asking if I have any recommendations on telescopes uh, for at-home use. Um, and I don't have any specific recommendations, um, but I will say that you can uh, get a great introductory telescope for a lot cheaper than you might think, um, around one or two hundred dollars or even less. In fact, binoculars are great tools for stargazing too. And with a decent and cheap telescope or a good pair of binoculars, you would be able to see the crescent shape on, on Venus or the rings of Saturn um, or the clouds of Jupiter. Uh, so it's pretty amazing and a lot of people don't realize that um, it doesn't take a lot to get into astronomy. Um, I will say though, I do like uh, reflecting telescopes that use mirrors because they're a little bit lighter and a little bit easier to set up in my opinion and a little bit better for beginners um, versus a refracting telescope. Uh, and they're also usually a bit cheaper. So uh, back to Leo, there are a couple notable stars in the constellation Leo. The star at the front of the constellation, the brightest star in it is called Regulus, which means little king. And the star at the end of Leo's tail is named Denebola, which means tail of the lion. Let's move on, and this constellation I want to show you next is actually hiding behind the Liberty Memorial, so I'm going to change our landscape here to a bit of a flatter landscape. This is the constellation I'm going to show you is Virgo the Maiden. She looks like a pretty large stick figure. Uh, so this is Virgo's head. Here are her arms. Here's her body and her legs. Virgo represents a goddess of fertility or harvest. The Greeks called her Demeter, the Romans called her Ceres. 
She's often depicted as carrying an ear of grain in one hand. In fact, that star in Virgo's hand is named Spica, and Spica means uh, ear of grain in Latin. Now, these constellations I've shown you uh, are part of a familiar group of constellations. There are 12 constellations in this group. You might have heard of them before or seen them in the newspaper. They're called the constellations of the zodiac, and they include a few other constellations that I have not pointed out. Taurus, which is setting here. Cancer is a bit difficult to spot. Um, and then we have uh, Libra here. Pop up the names for you. Uh, so these constellations are famous and more well known for their association with astrology. Astrology is the practice of using constellations to predict things about people, like your horoscope or your personality. Each constellation is called a zodiac sign, and they're typically associated with a range of birthdays. Now, of course, astronomers and astrologers are two different things. Astronomy and astrology are two different topics. Astronomers study the science of what we can observe and measure in space, and astrology is a fun hobby for some people, but there is no science to it. However, these constellations are important in astronomy as well, and that's because these constellations follow a very important pathway through the sky called the plane of the ecliptic. The plane of the ecliptic is a giant ring that stretches around the Earth, and it marks out roughly the path of our sun in the daytime sky. Uh, to illustrate what I mean here, let's go ahead and fast forward a little bit later in the evening. We'll see another, uh, a couple other constellations in the zodiac, and all the zodiac constellations fall along this line. Scorpius and Sagittarius rising a little bit later. I'll actually touch on them a little bit later in our tour. We can also see some planets along this line too. We have Jupiter and Saturn here, as well as Mars behind it. And we can see these planets are all close to this line as well. And we can continue looking at these constellations. And we can see by the time the sun rises, the sun is along this line as well. Now, I, as I said, the ecliptic marks out the plane of our solar system. So the Earth orbits around the sun in a flat disk, in a circle. Uh, and if we imagine that circle representing a plane, a disk, kind of like a big frisbee, that is the ecliptic. And if we extend that disk even further out into space, you would imagine how that disk lines up with the planets or other planets' orbits as well, because they all orbit relatively along the same plane. And if we extended that disk even further out into space, it would draw out the ecliptic line here and it would mark out where these constellations are in our evening sky. So when they say the sun is in the house of your constellation on your birthday, that means that literally the sun is in front of your constellation on your birthday. So if you've ever tried to find your zodiac sign in the night sky on your birthday, you are probably out of luck because, like I said, that constellation is behind the sun and not visible on your birthday. If you ever want to find your zodiac sign, I'd recommend looking for it in the night sky on your half birthday. All right, let's go ahead and turn off our constellations and the ecliptic line here. Uh, now, that was Spica. Uh, let me actually, let's uh, return to our Kansas City horizon to give us another better perspective so we have some familiar landmarks. All right, so Spica. Uh, is that star in Virgo, like I said. And there's another bright star near it. This is actually the brightest star in the evening sky tonight. Its name is Arcturus. Arcturus is part of a constellation that looks kind of like a sideways ice cream cone. Its name is Buotes. He's a hunter. Um, but Arcturus is the brightest star you'll see in the evening sky tonight, in the early evening sky at least. And there's a actually a little nifty saying you can use to help you remember Arcturus and Spica. All you have to do is find the handle of the Big Dipper, and notice how this handle is shaped like an arc. If you extend this arc across the sky, it passes through these two stars. And just remember this saying, arc to Arcturus, and speed on to Spica from the handle of the Big Dipper. So once again, just arc to Arcturus, and speed on to Spica, and that's an easy way to remember those two stars. I also wanted to mention that if we connect the stars Spica, Arcturus, and Denebola, it forms a nearly perfect equilateral triangle that's up high in the south in our spring skies. This is the Spring Triangle, a famous asterism that ancient people used to help them figure out the changing seasons. The way this works is that in the wintertime, you'll see these three stars rising one after another, but once all three are already up after sunset, that tells you spring has arrived. And as we approach summer, we can see that this asterism is already high in the sky after sunset. Now you might be wondering, 
What about the summer triangle? The summer triangle is a bit of more of a famous asterism, uh, and we can actually see the summer triangle starting to rise over in the east. The first star of the summer triangle is Vega, which is the fifth brightest star in the celestial sphere. This star is part of a constellation called Lyra the Harp, which is represented by this tiny little diamond. This harp uh, belonged to Orpheus, a famous poet and prophet. There we go. And we're going to cheat and fast forward a little bit later so I can show you the next constellation in the summer triangle, the next star. This next star is Deneb, this one right here, and it's the tail of Cygnus the Swan. Let's fast forward a little bit later. The Swan is a very simple constellation. It looks like a big cross, and we can also see it flying through the Milky Way here. So Deneb is the Swan's tail, and we can see its neck and outstretched wings. This swan represented one of the many disguises that Zeus, the king of the gods, used to take when he came down to Earth, down to, Earth to socialize with humanity. He liked disguising himself as a goose or a swan. And then the last star we can see rising a little bit later. This is after midnight, but this star has risen at this, that point tonight. And this is the star Altair, which is part of Aquila, the eagle. We can't quite see it, though, in our early evening sky, but we can see the eagle outlined there. And these three stars together make up the summer triangle. So once you see all three stars af up after sunset, then you know that summer is here. And this is how ancient people used to figure out the changing seasons. And we're going to switch back to our more level horizon um, because I want to show you something else you'll see in the early morning sky before sunrise. And that's a line of three planets. I pointed them out earlier when we saw the ecliptic. And these planets are Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Now Mars is on the move. It's uh, moving away from Jupiter and Saturn, but it's still uh, shining brightly in the early morning sky. This is about 4.30 a.m. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter, however, are getting closer together. Uh, and over the course of this year, uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be getting very close, and they'll actually be kind of getting closer and farther apart a couple times uh, due to retrograde motion, and that's just the perceived uh, motion of these planets as uh, they appear to go backwards when really it's just the Earth passing them in their orbits since they orbit so slowly. Um, but all that to say that Jupiter and Saturn will be getting closer and closer until finally they reach a point called conjunction where they are the closest they will ever appear in the night sky together. That date, uh, th that conjunction will uh, take place on December 21st of this year. So be sure not to miss that. That'll be in our evening sky at that point. Um, but they will be so close together that you'll be able to see them at, in the same frame of a telescope. So you'll, if you look through a telescope eyepiece with the right eyepiece, uh, you'll be able to see both planets at the same time. And this event only happens about once every 30 years. Uh, so it's a very rare event, so definitely you don't want to miss that. But right now you can see these two planets very close together already in our early morning skies. Um, but as the sun does eventually rise on a new day, this brings us to the conclusion of our uh, evening star tour for today, our What's Up stream. Oh, one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, you can see the moon rising uh, right before sunrise tonight. There is that moon. Uh, the moon right now is in a waning crescent phase. Um, so you probably won't see it unless you wake up very early tomorrow morning. Um, but as I said, when the sun comes up, the night sky disappears until the next sunset. Uh, and that does bring us to the end of today's What's Up live stream. Um, and I'm just checking the comments, but it looks like we don't have any more questions for the time being. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up our stream for today. Uh, thank you all again for tuning in uh, to our What's Up live stream today. Um, a little reminder, we did used to do Friday live streams uh, where we answered your questions on uh, all day or for the entire stream on Fridays. Um, uh, but we are no longer doing our Friday, uh, uh, Fan Friday streams. But as you can see, uh, as you saw today, we are still answering your questions live in the air. So if you do end up having any questions, uh, please drop them in the comments here. We'll write them down and I'll answer them on Wednesday. And if you have questions during Wednesday's stream as well, I'll answer those live on the air too. But we are just streaming on Mondays and Wednesdays for the time being. Uh, if you tuned in uh, a little bit uh, after our start, I just want to remind you that uh, Union Station has announced plans to reopen our doors uh, slowly and safely. Those plans can be found on the Union Station Facebook page or our website at unionstation.org. I'm not going to go into detail, but you can read about that for yourself. We'll be opening uh, in a limited fashion in the middle of June. Uh, that is our current plan. So uh, read up on that. We can't wait to see you live in person safely. 
um, when the planetarium does reopen as well. For the time being, though, thank you all so much for continuing to support us by watching these live streams, sharing them with your friends and family, uh, for liking and subscribing to the Planetarium Facebook page. Uh, thank you to all of our members for continuing your ongoing support, and thank you to everyone who has donated um, or supported us in any other way over the past couple months. Um, so that does it for today's stream. Uh, this has been your Planetarium Specialist, Patrick Hess, signing off. I will see you again on Wednesday, where we will dive into the fantastical universes of fiction for our Wednesday deep dive stream. Have a great evening, everyone. See you next time.